Welcome to Pivot Point this morning, Sunday, October 1st, 2023. Today is the first Sunday of the month and we will be celebrating communion. So take a moment to gather your elements. Today I'm using a tortilla and some juice. We will conclude our time together with a communion service. If you want, download the worksheet for today. It can be found on our website at www.pivotpointchurch.org or on our free app, which you can find on Google or Apple. Please comment on whatever platform you're watching us on so we know you're here. And if you can, please fill out our Connect card on our website or app because we would love to hear from you. Don't forget to listen to today's worship music playlist, which can be found on our YouTube channel. The link can be found on our website. Please like and share our videos so others can find us. And hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our messages. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to get together to know you better. Open our hearts and minds and ears to be receptive to you, God, so that your word can become manifest in our lives. Let us learn what you need us to learn from this message so that we can apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been going through the tenets of our faith, and this week we will be learning about fasting. I believe that fasting is one of the least understood facets of our faith. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, to fast means to abstain from food. It's so clear that it would be useless for us to quote scriptures from David or Nehemiah, Isaiah, the prophets, or even the New Testament, because they all agree that to fast means not to eat for a prescribed time. Fasting, though, is more a matter of obedience than it is the actual act of going without food. It is an outward sign of an inward commitment to refuse to surrender to the will of the flesh and allow the rise of the desires of the Spirit of God within us. Because we know there is a constant battle between flesh and spirit, and fasting allows us to focus on the Spirit and to bring our flesh under control. Richard Foster writes, more than any other single discipline, fasting reveals the things that controls us. This is a wonderful benefit to the true disciple who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We cover up what's inside us with food and other good things, but in fasting, these things surface. Fasting on a regular basis can draw us closer to God and strengthen our faith and our resolve to do God's will. Fasting, like going to the gym, builds the muscles of your faith. Too often, though, the focus of fasting is on the lack of food. Instead, the purpose of fasting should be to take our eyes off the things of this world and to focus completely on God. Fasting is a way to demonstrate to God and to ourselves that we're serious about our relationship with him. It helps us gain a new perspective and a renewed reliance upon God. Matthew 6, 16 through 18 says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, 
So it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This verse is saying when you fast. Did you see it? When. It's assuming that you will fast, and it gives you instructions for it. We're to fast without promoting ourselves or making the focus about us. We should behave as if we're not fasting, by dressing as always and doing our hair or our makeup, and to go about our day as if nothing is happening. Fasting is the most powerful spiritual discipline of all the Christian disciplines, and yet fasting is one of the most neglected of all spiritual disciplines. It's almost a lost practice in the church today. And yet John Wesley, who fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays, called for all Methodists to fast once a week because it was one of the means of grace. But before we begin a fast, we need to seek the Holy Spirit for directions. We need to seek the Holy Spirit and his guidance for our fast. Seek out what type of fast, what you should be fasting from, and for how long. Now, most fasts are only one day or maybe for just one meal, but God may want you to have a more intense time of fasting. Fasting should not be a time we hope to lose weight because then all we're doing is a diet with a little prayer. Our focus would be on the wrong thing, on ourselves rather than God. So, but why should we fast? And what is the purpose of fasting? Well, first, it's to seek deliverance. In 2 Chronicles 23 through 4, King Jehoshaphat prayed and fasted for God to deliver him from opposing armies. And Esther states in 4 6, Go and gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants was fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Well, Esther prayed and fasted and asked others to fast on her behalf for the deliverance of her people from annihilation. We see in 1 Samuel 28 that Saul fasted when his army was under attack from the Philistines, asking that God would deliver the Jews in battle. And in Acts 27, well, when Paul was in the midst of a storm, and had no hope to survive, he and his fellow passengers fasted for 14 days. The second reason to fast is to express grief. Three of the first four references to fasting in the Bible connect it with grief. In 2 Samuel 1, 11, when David learns of King Saul's death, David and his men tore their clothes in sorrow when they heard the news. They mourned and wept, and fasted. Ezra mourned over Israel's unfaithfulness when with fasting. The third reason is for repentance. When a person was convicted of their sin, they began to fast as an act of repentance. Examples include the Israelites' confession of the sin of idolatry at Mizpah, and it's found in 1 Samuel 7, 6. Nineveh, fasted for repentance, found in Jonah 3, 5 through 8. And Saul fasted after his experience on the road to Damascus, found in Acts 9. Joel 2, 12 through 13 says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Fasting as repentance was often accompanied by the wearing of sackcloth and placing of ashes on one's head, much as a sign of mourning, because they were mourning their disobedience to God. The fourth reason we would fast is to draw ourselves closer to God with prayer. Prayer in the Bible is often accompanied by fasting to show the earnest desire for God's answer. 
This is what Cornelius the centurion did as he prayed. He fasted, hoping that God would grant his prayer request, which he did, by sending Peter to him. Acts 10.30, Sir Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Fasting doesn't change God's hearing as much as it changes us and our prayers. Fasting with prayer is kind of like the difference between a lamp and a laser. The first is diffused and it's unfocused light, while the second is focused and concentrated. It is in the times when prayer and fasting are done together that our prayers are focused and our hearts and minds and desires are uh, God's while we listen for him to hear his voice and his answers. The fifth reason is to discern God's will. How many of us are seeking an answer? We're seeking to know what he wants us to do next. I know in this household, we have a couple of situations where we are praying for God's will to be revealed to us. Daniel fasted for 21 days looking for God's guidance and understanding. And when Jesus fasted in the wilderness, it was so he could discern God's will for his life and his ministry. The apostles joined in fasting and prayer when they desired the blessings of God before any of their great endeavors. Paul and Barnabas prayed and fasted for God's guidance with the appointment of elders in Acts 14.23. We can read that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders um, for each of them, for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Fasting makes us more receptive to God's guidance. It's taking our focus off of our flesh, off ourselves, so that we can clear out the rubble of a day and hear what God has to say. I like the acronym PUSH when facing a difficult situation or a time of decision making that just seems overwhelming. PUSH stands for pray until something happens. Fasting just helps us focus on the prayer rather than ourselves. So every time you got a hunger pang or your stomach growls, that should be a good reminder we should spend that time praying. These are the reasons that people have fasted in scripture, but why should we fast? John Wesley answered it this way, because we're commanded to give alms, pray, fast. In such a manner is a clear command to perform all those duties. John Wesley thinks that these are the things that make for a good Christian life, but there are still further motives and some encouragements to fast. Fasting and prayer can restore the loss of our first love for your Lord. It can result in a more intimate relationship with Christ. Fasting enables the Holy Spirit to move more fully in your life as you are more attuned and receptive. Fasting will kick, quicken the word of God in your heart and his truth will become even more meaningful to you. Fasting can transform your prayer life into a richer and more personal experience. Fasting can result in a dynamic personal revival in your own life and make you a channel of revival to others. Lastly, fasting is a means of receiving more of God's grace. And we could all use more of that. And there are two kinds of fasts in the Bible. There's a partial fast and an absolute fast. A partial fast is described in the book of Daniel when he abstained from food but still drank water. Absolute fasts are no food or water. And for our purposes today, we're going to be talking about a partial fast for food only. During a fast, we should drink plenty of liquids. 
and the range and the length of the fasts in the Bible are from one day to 40 days. Most of the fasts in the Bible are only one day in length, and that's what we are speaking about today, a one-day fast. Lent is often used as a time to fast or to refocus our attention on God rather than our personal desires. A biblical fast is to abstain from eating, but many of us have medical conditions that make a true fast difficult or impossible. I have heard people say that they will fast from social media, TV, or chocolate, but unless that thing you are fasting from is a main part of your life, like food is, it isn't really a fast. You have a regular t- if you have a regular time that you engage in social media, TV, or if you have chocolate every day, it could count as long as you use the time that you'd be consuming those items to spend the time in prayer and study. Fasting is a time to fine-tune our relationship with God by eliminating those things that keep us focused on our fleshly desires. If you are going to fast and pray, We need the Holy Spirit to lead us. This is true no matter what type of fast you're going to undertake. God always deals with us right where we are to take us where he wants us to be. And physical limitations should always be considered when undertaking a fast. So how do you go about the discipline of fasting? Well, first, we must prepare. We have to examine our heart for any unconfessed sin. Scripture records that God always requires his people to repent of their sins before he will hear their prayers. In Psalm Psalm 66, 16 through 20, King David said, Come and hear of all of you who reverence the Lord, and I will tell you what he did for me. For I cried to him for help with praises ready on my tongue. He would not have listened if I had not confessed my sins. But he listened. He heard my prayer. He paid attention to it. Fasting is not just spiritual. It is also physical. Resist the urge to have that last big feast before a fast. It's also helpful to wean yourself off of caffeine and sugar to ease your initial hunger or discomfort in the early stages of your fast. I will give you more suggestions for your fast later. The second thing we should do is keep it a secret. Remember he says in that verse in Matthew that we are not to uh, draw attention to ourselves. Jesus repeats this warning that fasting to draw attention to ourselves and receive the praise of men does nothing but make you a hypocrite. Let's go over it again, that one in Matthew. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put some oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others you are fasting, but only to your father, who is unseen, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's all about the relationship between you and God. So the secrecy is not because we don't want others to know about it. It's because this is something special between you and God, and he wants all of your attention. Fasting isn't supposed to be broadcast in order to make us look good. Jesus warns us that the applause of people is the only reward we'll gain if we do it that way. I would much rather have God applauding me than a bunch of people applauding me. The third reason to fast is to be able to spend significant time with God. Fasting is not just about denying yourself food. It's exchanging the needs of your physical body for those of the spiritual body. There are three things we must do in the midst of a fast. Prayer, praise, and Bible study. The more time you spend with God in these three activities, the more meaningful your fast will be. While fasting, if you 
Focus your energy on numerous errands or busy work to the neglect of spending special time with God, you will starve both physically and spiritually. So take the time you would normally use to prepare food, eat it, and clean up after it, and spend that time with God instead. Among the things we have to do, remember the first thing we have to do while we're in our fast is to spend time in prayer. So if we're supposed to be eating and we're ta- instead of eating now, we spend dinner time or, or such, we are now spending that time in prayer. Long times of prayer and listening for God's voice are essential if you are to enter into a more intimate communion with God to maintain your fast all the way to its completion. Remember, fasting is meant to put you in a place of waiting on and listening to God. If you're so busy doing everything else except that, you're going to miss out on the benefits. God will enable you to experience his command to pray without ceasing as you seek his presence. Fasting without spending significant time with God is really nothing more than dieting. The second thing we do while we're fasting is to praise God. When praying for your own needs and the needs of others, those are important. There are very important reasons to fast and pray when you're seeking a specific answer. However, don't get so caught up in praying for yourself and others that you forget to simply praise God for who he is. True spiritual fasting focuses on God, not on us, not on our needs, not on the prayers, the answers we're seeking but we focus ourselves on God. Center your total being on him and your attitudes and your actions and your motives and your desires and your words all focus on what God needs. This can only take place if God and the Holy Spirit are at the center of our attention, not in the peripheral. Your motive in fasting must be to glorify God not to have an emotional experience, and not to attain personal happiness. Because ultimately, fasting is to get us closer to God. Yes, we may be seeking an answer to an issue in our lives. However, the answer to all our problems is God. The third thing we should be doing while we're fasting is to read his word. Meditate on him when you wake up in the night. Sing praises to him whenever you please. Focus on your heavenly father and make every act one of praise and worship. The fourth thing we need to do is anticipate the battle. And it's going to be more than physical. As you enter this time of heightened spiritual devotion, be aware that Satan is going to do everything he can to pull you away from your prayer and Bible reading time. When you feel the enemy trying to discourage you, immediately go to God in prayer and ask him to strengthen your resolve in the face of difficulties and temptations. We fight this battle on a regular basis at Pivot Point. Uh, Satan is constantly trying to discourage us and to throw difficulties at us. Know that the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against Satan and his dominion. Don't forget that and don't give up. The enemy wants to make you a target because he knows that fasting is going to be the most powerful of all Christian disciplines and that God may have something very special to show you when you wait on him and seek his face. He's going to try to keep that from happening. Satan does not want you to grow in your faith and he will do anything from making you hungry and grumpy to bringing up trouble in your family or at work to make you stop. Make prayer your shield against such attacks and be aware of it when things, bad things start to happen while you're trying to fast. And although fasting can be an indescribable blessing, it is not easy for everyone. Don't be surprised if you experience mental or physical discomforts. And to begin with, you may experience some inner conflict 
as you deny yourself the pleasure of eating delicious food. Any sort of fast may sometimes leave you feeling impatient or irritable. Hunger pangs may plague you. But when your motives are right, God will honor your seeking heart and bless your time with him in a very special way. A renewed closeness with God and a greater sensitivity to spiritual things are usually the results of a fast. But don't be disappointed if you don't have a mountaintop experience. Many people will feel a nearness to God that they've never before known. But others who have honestly sought his report, uh, his face report no particular outward results at all. Still for others, their fast was physical, emotional, and spiritually grueling. But they knew they had been called by God to fast, and they completed the fast as an act of worship and obedience. And God honored that commitment. Lastly, we need to make sure you consult your doctor before you fast. But be aware that many doctors have never been trained in this area, so their understanding is limited. It won't hurt to have a physical exam to make sure you're in good health and you're not on any medication which could conflict with a fast. Recognize that your body is unique and your approach to fasting must take into consideration your personal needs and your circumstances. And while many healthcare professionals agree that fasting can have a beneficial effect on the body, some people should avoid fasting or may need to modify their fasting in, in some way. There are some people, though, that should not fast, not from food. We'd have to find another means to create this fasting experience. People who are physically too thin or emaciated would not benefit from a physical fast. If you're prone to eating disorders, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, if you have weakness or anemia or tumors, ulcers, cancers, blood diseases, or heart disease. If you suffer from chronic problems with kidneys, liver, lung, hearts, or other important organs, a fast might be too taxing. People who take insulin for diabetes or suffer blood sugar problems like hypoglycemia, make sure you check with your doctor. A fast might be something you cannot take on. Pregnant women or nursing women might need to experience and check with their doctor. While you're fasting, you may experience symptoms that of a worsening condition. So stop your fast and see your physician if something arises during your fast. Don't wait. Please take care of yourself. But we want you to, to recognize that fasting has significant benefits. If you are able, if your doctor clears you from this or allows you to do it, I encourage you to do it. God doesn't need you to have a near-death experience, though, while fasting. He doesn't need that from you. He wants you to have a life experience, something that changes who you are. So if you fall into one of these categories and you can't go without food because of medical reasons, are you going to miss out on this means of grace? Now, today, media fasts are just as important as fasts from food. These can include no TV, no cable, no radio, no magazines, not even newspapers, no social media, no Facebook, no Twitter, no internet, no surfing. The question is this, am I willing to give up any or all of that for a period of time so I can focus on God for a while? I know that might be a harder fast for most of us than fasting from food. When do you spend an exempt, uh, enormous amount of time on social media to put it aside for a time in order for you to spend time with God? That would count as a fast. Your time of fasting, though, should not be made on a whim. Don't, don't turn off this video and go, okay, I'm on a fast starting today. Um... I want you to spend a little time thinking about it and praying about it. Determine what you're going to fast from and for how long. In addition, 
you probably need to figure out why you're fasting. Are you seeking an answer that seems to be eluding you? Do you need a breakthrough in some area of your life? Do you want a deeper relationship with God or deliverance from something? Think about what it is you want to get from your time of fasting and remember to take this concern or request to God during the fast because that's part of the reason we're doing it. And don't forget to spend time in the Bible during this time as often God will answer you through his word. It might also be a good idea to spend a few days preparing for your fast, especially if you are anticipating a longer fast. Some things you can do to help you be successful in your fast is to abstain from caffeine and sugar for several days beforehand and eat smaller meals for a few days before. Do not drink alcohol or sodas and increase the amount of water you drink. These are all physical things to help your body be able to withstand a fast. Fasting is an intensely personal decision, as are all means of grace. This week, I want to challenge you to pray about making fasting a regular part of your life. Fasting isn't just a practice for the religious fanatic. It's for anyone who wants to get serious about Jesus. Jesus expects us to fast. He said, when you fast. So he's expecting it. And the benefits are just phenomenal. If you're satisfied with the status quo of your spiritual life, then go ahead and ignore everything I've said today. But if you're ready to move on to another level and you're not fasting as part of your walk with Christ already, then I'd say start right away. Don't deny yourself the blessing of focusing on God this way, okay? And watch God do his thing. If you do a fast and you have a breakthrough, share with us. We would love to hear how God is moving in your life. So as it's kind of ironic, though, to have a message on fasting on the day we're having communion. Food is vital to so many areas of our worship. The time of communion reminds us of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. Fasting helps us to draw closer to him. So gather your elements now, some bread, cracker, chips, and a drink. Doesn't have to be juice, but that's what I am using. And prepare your hearts to receive the elements. Who can come to the table? Anyone who calls Jesus Christ Savior. Because it is Christ's table and he is the one who invites you to participate. Those who come to the table are not limited to those of any specific nationality, a race, or gender, or political identity. Because this table belongs to God who reconciles us to one another and welcomes the hungry to partake in the feast which God has prepared. So come you who are broken and you who are whole. Come, you who have failed and you who are faithful. Come, regardless of your race, your sexuality, your gender, your nationality, or your social status, because this table is for you. And it is Christ who invites you. It is Christ who made the way for you. If you feel Christ calling you to this table, you are welcome. The table is prepared. Let's prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to be with us and keep us safe uh, as we go about our day. Open our hearts to receive you. As we receive these elements, God, do not shy away from us. Let us feel your presence. Let us feel your guidance. Let us Know that you here are with us. You said when two or more are gathered, you will be here also. And although many of us are separated by miles while we're watching the video together, we know, God, that in spite of that distance, we are one. We are a body. You are here with us. Bless this time and bless these elements to our bodies, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took his bread and he broke it. 
I gave thanks. And he said, this, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this, this is my blood poured out for you in the new covenant. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. We're so glad that you've been able to be with us today. Thank you for watching. Join us on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. for our Zoom Bible study so that um, we can see you and uh, we'll have a, a Zoom time. It's an interactive Bible study where we're going through Chuck Missler's Bible in 24 Hours. It's an incredible study. Go ahead and complete that Connect card on our website or app and comment on whatever platform you're watching so that we know you're here we really could use that encouragement of knowing who's watching. We hope that you can join us for our very first mission trip. Um, I think this is the next slide. Let's comment our mission trip. Um, we're heading to San Antonio to help raise money for Noah's Farm, which drills wells, among other things, for people in Zimbabwe. Details and registration are available on our website or our app under events on the calendar. If you found this ministry to be a benefit to you, please consider supporting us. The easiest way is by using the Give tab on our website or our app. All donations are tax deductible. Don't forget to share our videos and posts as it helps the logarithm push our content out to more people. And make sure you like us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube because those numbers also help us get in front of more people. We're so glad that you were able to be here today. We hope you join us again next Sunday. Don't forget Tuesday night is our Chuck Missler's Bible study. Uh, it is an interactive Zoom meeting. You cannot watch it later. So if you want to watch it and you would like to uh, have some more information on that, you can reach out to me at, I'm gonna get my thing to show up, at uh, pastor.ruthking at yahoo.com. I'll be able to help you get all the stuff you need to be able to complete that study all on your own. We would love to pray with you or for you. Please fill out the prepare request card on the website or app. We'll be adding your prayer request to our prayer list and our prayer team will add it to theirs. We have a prayer team that's ready and you can be part of it if you would like to. Just fill out that comment card and let us know. This week, I hope you can find a way to be a blessing. See you next time.